Hey, hey there, and welcome to the second part of the chapter 17 lecture. So chapter 17, remember we are talking about kinetics, and we already talked about the rate expression and the rate law. Well, now we're going to move on to sort of the third type of equation in the chapter, which is the integrated rate law. So an integration is a function of calculus. So basically we can take the rate law equation and we can integrate it, do some calculus, and beep, 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 boop, we end up with a linear equation. That's me doing calculus. Okay, so remember um, from maybe algebra, I don't know, that a linear equation is one with the form y equals mx plus b, where b is the y-intercept and m is the slope, and then y is the y point, the point on the y-axis, and x is the, is the coordinates on the x-axis. <clears throat> so it's the, it's the equation for a line. So we can use linear equations. They're really convenient because they allow us some predictive ability. So when you draw a, or when you graph a line, right, if you have two points on that line, then, um, so if you can, if you solve these two points, then you can draw a line and then you can solve any of the points on this line, or you can read any of the points off those line, this line. So that's why linear equations are very convenient um, and why we, you know, why the integrated rate law was derived from the rate law so that we could use it to make some predictions about rates at different concentrations and different times. So where we use it is if we want to know the concentration at a different time in the reaction, a different time point in the reaction. So we can use it mathematically and we'll learn the different linear equations and we can then just like plug numbers in and solve for, for different variables. We can also use it graphically where we can graph data, get a line, and then answer questions from that. <clears throat> so the integrated rate laws for the three different ordered reactions that we've talked about. So again, let's revisit this very simple reaction of A goes to B or A becomes products. And if this is a zero order reaction, the integrated rate law is this. A sub T, so this is the concentration of A at time T equals the negative K, the rate constant, times t time plus the concentration of a at time zero or the initial concentration for first order reaction the integrated rate law is the natural log ln is natural log oops the natural log of the concentration of A at time T equals negative KT plus the natural log of the initial concentration. So it's almost the same exact as the zero order integrated rate law, except that we take the natural log of the concentrations. And then for the second order rate law, integrated rate law, it's one over the concentration of A at time T and this one has a positive K. Um, oops, <clears throat> on autopilot, one over the initial concentration. Okay, so notice that all of these are in a linear format. They are all in the format of M, e, or sorry, <laughs> of Y, equals mx plus b. All right, so these are all linear equations. All right, um, notice that for zero order and first order, there's a negative sign in front of k. k in each of these equations represents the slope. 
So, <clears throat> um, in zero order and in first order reactions, we will see a negative slope. And a negative slope has the line going downhill. All right, but for second order reactions, K is positive, so the slope is positive. All right, in other words, it's going uphill. So these are just things to generally know and understand and recognize about these linear equations. So if we were to look at these, what we would see for a zero order reaction, we would see a straight line on a graph where we are um, graphing on the y-axis concentration, all right? This is a zero order. So y, our y-axis is just concentration and um, versus time. Notice that, by the way, x, okay, x in all of these react in the, all of these equations is time. Okay, so all of these, you'll notice that the x-axis for all of these graphs is time. What changes is the variable on the y-axis, what we're graphing on the y-axis. So for a zero-order reaction, we're just graphing concentration. For a first-order reaction, we're graphing the natural log of concentration. And for a second-order reaction, we're graphing the inverse of concentration, or one over concentration and we'll get a straight line. So if we had a zero order reaction and we graphed the natural log of the concentration, we would get a, a line, but it wouldn't be straight. It would be curved. Um, so it's whichever function gives us the straight line that's gonna tell us um, what type of reaction it is. So we're gonna do a, a sort of practice problem here. All right, looking at graphical determination of the reaction order um, not rate order, of the reaction order and the rate constant, all right? So in order to determine the rate law for a reaction from a set of data that you acquire doing an experiment, you can make three graphs. And so in other words, those three graphs that I just showed you. So you can do one where you have concentration versus time one where you have the natural log of concentration um, versus time, and one where you have the inverse of concentration versus time. All right, and we're looking for a linear graph, a straight line. We're looking for which one of these gives us a straight line. If this one gives us a straight line, then that means it's a zero order reaction. If this one gives us a straight line, that means it's a first order reaction. And if this one gives us a straight line, that means it's a second order reaction. Okay, so whichever graph is linear indicates the order of the reaction, at least with respect to A, with whatever that reactant is, okay? And as I pointed out um, on the slide before, K in each of those equations is M from Y equals MX plus B, it's the slope. And just a reminder, um, a little linear equation reminder, slope is um, rise over run, or the change in Y over the change in x. So if we know two points on a line, um, we can figure out what the slope is between them as we just figure out what's the difference between the two points on the y-axis, the two y-coordinates, and the difference between the two x-coordinates, and do some division. All right, so let's do this example problem. It says write the rate law, write the rate law for each of the following reactions of A reacts to form products. So we've got row one, row two, and row three. So these are the three different um, reactions for A becomes products. So in this first one, we've graphed it the three different ways. And the one that gives us a straight line is this one here in the middle. 
the one that graphs the natural log of A versus time. So this reaction is first order, okay? And the rate law from the previous section is rate equals K times whatever, in this case A, to the one power because it's first order, okay? So that would be the rate law for this reaction. Notice that the slope here is a negative slope. Um, it's downhill. Um, in the second one, we have we have three graphs. Two of them have curved lines. One of them has a straight line. The one that gives us the linear straight line is the one that graphs concentration versus time. And that is classic uh, zero order. I have it wrong in my notes. All right, so a zero order reaction. And so if we were to write the rate law for this, it would just be that rate equals K. Rate equals K times A to the zero power, which is one, so it's just rate equals K. And then this last one, the third one down here, the straight line is uh, when we graph the inverse of concentration, and that is classic second order kinetics. And the um, rate law for this reaction would be second order with respect to A, so we would have the square there, okay? So that's how the, so when we graph the integrated rate law, we get a linear uh, straight line. Okay, so the key thing to, um, that I'm just gonna like sort of star here and maybe write in red is don't get confused, because you will, between the rate law and the integrated rate law. These are two different things. So rate law is where we were writing rate equals K times A to the N, whatever N is, whether it's zero, one, two, can be other things, but we're gonna kind of stick with those numbers. The integrated rate law are linear equations. All right, we basically do some calculus to this rate law, calculus, and we derive the integrated rate law. So the integrated rate law is, is derived from the rate law. They are mathematically related. They're not two different things, really. They're just two different forms of the same thing, I suppose, in math, but they feel like two different things. So I usually kind of talk about them as if they're two different things, but just know they're not. I just don't know the calculus to show you the derivation. <laughs> All right, next, um, let's do a practice problem. So this one, we're going to practice doing, so in this one here, up here, we were looking at graphed data. Now we're going to do some graphing of data. So we have the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is followed as a function of time. Graph the data to determine the order and rate constant for the reaction. So here's the reaction. It's hydrogen peroxide decomposing to form water and oxygen, which it does in your hydrogen peroxide bottle in your medicine cabinet. All right, so at time zero, we initially start out with one molar hydrogen peroxide, and by six hours, we're down to 0.5 molar, by 12 hours, we're down to 0.25 molar, and so on and so forth. So um, if we wanted to graph this and figure out what we want to know what determine the order and the rate constant which is k for this reaction okay so the first thing we need to do is determine the order and we need to determine the order by graphing it three ways we need to graph the concentration versus time the natural log of the concentration versus time and the inverse of the concentration over time so I left these two columns blank for us to calculate it. So the natural log is a function on your calculator. So on my calculator, I have to type, if I wanna hit the natural log of one, so we're trying to calculate the natural log of the concentration and at this time point, it's one. 
The natural log of one is zero. I have to type one and then hit natural log, hit LN on my calculator. All right, the natural log of 0.5, I type into my calculator 0.5 LN, and I get negative 0 0.693. The natural log of 0.25, is negative 1.386. The natural log of 0.125 is negative 2.079. And the natural log at 24 hours here is 2.7, negative 2.772. And then the inverse is just gonna be one divided by the concentration. So one divided by one is one. One divided by 0.5 is two. 1 divided by 0.25 is 4. 1 divided by 0 0.125, oops, <laughs> I meant to say that, not write that, is 8. Right? And the inverse of 0 0.0625 is 16. So there's also an inverse function on your calculator. So you can do 1 divided by the concentration, or you can type in the concentration and then hit this button on your calculator, which is the inverse. Um, and then you could take this table, put it in Excel or some other graphing program and draw uh, and display the graphs. So um, this one, this first one here is a graph of the concentration versus time. This one, the second one, we'll call it graph B, all right, is the natural log of the concentration versus time, and C is the inverse of concentration over time. So the question is, which one gives us a straight line? And the answer is ding, 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 B, okay? So if, it, if the natural log um, of concentration versus time gives us a straight line, that means that this is a first order reaction. So we answered that first question. Is it, what is the order of the reaction? We solved using the data by graphing the data in three different ways. We figured out it's a first order reaction. It follows first order kinetics. Now we want to solve for K. The other thing it asked us was the rate constant. Well, there's two ways we can do this. Two ways to solve for K, the rate constant. So the first one is that we remember that K, all right, is the slope, all right. It's the it's going to be the absolute value of the slope. So some in this case, in first order and zero order reactions, the slope is negative. Um, it's negative K. So K, the rate constant, is never a negative. The rate constant is always going to be a positive. So I put those absolute lines there okay and remember the slope of any line is rise over run rise over run which is the same thing as change in y over change in x all right so we could calculate this we could pick two spots on this line which are basically two spots from the data table and so I'm going to I'm gonna do this in a color. Um, so I'm going to pick just two of these time points. So I'm going to, the ones I picked in my notes were at 18 minutes and six or 18 hours and six hours, whatever. Yeah, it was hours. Um, and so the, since we were graphing on here, the Y is the natural log. Okay, so the change, if I'm picking, basically I'm picking this point and this point here. Okay, so the change in Y is going to be this here. So I'm going to do some subtraction. So the final at 18 hours, it was negative 2 points, oops, 2.079. Minus negative 0 0.693. That's my change in y. All right. 
And when you subtract a negative, it's the same thing as adding. So I'm just going to put a plus there. And then my change in x from those two points here is the difference between 18 and 6. My final point, 18 hours minus 6 hours. So my change in y overall is negative 1.3. 8, 6, and my change in x is 12, and I get negative 0.1155, all right? Um, it's negative 0.1155, but I want the absolute value of this, so I'm just going to make it positive 0.1155, and this is the K for a first order reaction is going to be, normally it's second, inverse seconds, but our unit of time in this problem is hours, so it will be inverse hours. So this would be our K, and this is one way to solve for K in this problem. Another way, um, method two here, all right, would be to use the integrated rate law. Use integrated rate law to solve for k. All right, so this is again a first order reaction. So we would use the first order, the integrated rate law for first order reactions, which is the natural log of the concentration at time t equals negative k t plus the natural log of the concentration initially at time zero. Now you don't have to memorize these equations. Um, even in a, I mean, in an online class, there's hardly anything I, I make you responsible for memorizing. Um, but even in class, I allow students to reference that a chart that tells you these different um, integrated rate laws. But what you need to be able to do is determine what order of the reaction um, is so that you know which integrated rate law to use. That's the important part. Okay, so now we can just plug in from that experiment. We can pick um, any data time. So um, let's pick time at uh, 24 hours. Why not? If we pick the 24 hour time point. Okay, so at 24 hours, um, we had the natural log of the concentration at that time was, if you refer back to the table, 2.772, negative 2.772, and negative k times the time of 24 hours, plus the natural log of the initial concentration, which was 1. All right, the natural log of 1 is 0. Um, negative k times 24. Now I'm going to divide both sides by negative 24, and I get a k of, oh, look at that, 0.1155 inverse hours, all right? Same thing that we got before, all right? What if I didn't choose the 24-hour time point? What if I chose the 12-hour time point? Um, if I chose the 12 hour time point, that says 12 hours, all right, and I plug in the data into the integrated rate law. So the natural log of the concentration at 24 hours was 1.386, negative K times 12 hours, plus the natural log of 1, which is 0. Um, so I'm going to divide both sides by negative 12, and I'm going to get, guess what, k equals 0 0.1155 inverse hours, okay? So any one of these methods is correct. You can use um, rise over run to solve for slope, slope being k. Or you can use the integrated rate law and plug in the values, the data that we have, 
um, to solve for k. And you could use any one of those data time points to plug in and you would get the same answer because that is why it is a constant. k is the rate constant. It is constant no matter the time point and what the concentration is, it's this, uh, this k will always come out to be the same thing, more or less, you know, little error, plus or minus there. Okay, another practice problem for you. So there's, of course, always, you know, like hundreds of different ways that problems can be phrased. The key is understanding these integrated rate laws, understanding um, how to tell what order a reaction is based on graphed data, and understanding how to plug numbers in, into the integrated rate law formulas in order to solve for things. So in this one, it says the rate constant for the first order decomposition of cyclobutane at 500 degrees Celsius is 9.2 times 10 to the negative third inverse seconds. How long will it take for 80% of a sample of of uh, cyclobutane to decompose. And here is the equation. I kind of hit it in there, so I'm gonna highlight it there. All right, so the first thing that's important is it tells us that this is a first order reaction. That is an important clue we wanna highlight because for whenever we're doing kinetics, we always need to know the order of the reaction, essentially. We always need to know, is it zero order, first order, second order? So if it tells us that, that's an important piece of information. It also tells us that the rate constant is 9.2 times 10 to the negative third inverse seconds. Now, if it didn't tell us that it was first order, we could still determine it was first order because of the units of K, right? Remember the units of K are different depending on the order of the reaction. So even if it didn't say first order, we could have used those units as our clue that this is a first order reaction. So we know that it's first order. We know the value of K is 9.2 times 10 to the negative third inverse seconds. And we wanna know how long it will take, how long it will take. We want to know time um, for 80% of the sample to decompose. All right, so if we're talking about a first order reaction here, we're using the first order integrated rate law. So this is the rate law that we want to use. All right, but we don't know the starting concentration or the end concentration. All right, so let's just do my usual thing where I mark off what we know. We know, okay, we're given that. All right, and we want to find T. So it feels like we don't have enough information, but it's giving us a percentage. And so if it gives you a percentage, 80%, a percent is an amount out of 100, okay? So in other words, if we had started with 100, all right, and 80% of it decomposes, then we'll, end up with 20, right? And we'll call this molarity. Why not? Um, and we can plug those numbers in. We could plug in any number. We could plug in 1 and 0.2. We could plug in 487 and then whatever 20% of 487 is. It does not matter. We can pick numbers. We're just looking for an 80% decline from initial to final. So we're calling this our initial concentration, and this, our final concentration at time t, and time t is what we're looking for. So now we have these two, and we're left with the one variable of t, so we can go ahead and solve. So I'm gonna just plug in what we have. So we said that our final concentration is 20 molar at time t, that negative, or k is 9.2 times 10 to the negative third inverse seconds times t plus, oops, I forgot the natural log up front here, the natural log of 100 molar. All right, 
So the natural log, I didn't use these numbers. Okay. The natural log of 100. Oh, how do I make this? Mm. Internet calculator. All right, natural log of 20. The natural log of 20 is 2.9957. And I'm just carrying it out extra sig figs because I'm still in the middle of this problem. Um, times negative 9.2 times 10 to the negative third t, my variable, my x. And the natural log of 100 is 4.6052. All right, so I'm going to subtract negative, subtract 4.60, oops, 4.6052. From both sides so that's going to cancel out and 2.9957 minus 4.6052 equals negative 1.6095 I'm going to divide both sides by negative 9.2 times 10 to the negative third. And t equals divided by equals 178.8. I only have two sig figs in this problem, so I'm going to round that to two sig figs of 180. And this is in seconds. I lost my units in here because I got too lazy to write them, which is not good my little seconds there, inverse seconds, inverse seconds, and when I divide by inverse seconds, they become regular seconds. So our time, in order for it to decrease by 80%, will be 180 seconds. Notice that the temperature was listed in this problem, but the temperature is sort of a little bit of a red herring. You don't need it in this calculation. The reason it's listed is because the K the uh, rate constant actually is different at different temperatures. And so the temperature is relevant in the sense that we're talking about the rate constant at this, at this specific temperature. At a different temperature, it would be different. Drink break. All right, another example. I'm just gonna do lots of these problems. And notice in each of the problems, I'm trying to make them slightly different. So, you know, in the one up here, we were solving for K using the integrated rate law. In this one, we use the integrated rate law to solve for T, for time. Um, and in this one, we're going to be solving for concentration. So um, like all formulas in chemistry, um, questions can be worded in different ways to have you solve for different variables. But like many questions in this chapter, we're still just going to be dealing with the integrated rate law. All right, so let's read the problem. The reaction of butadiene gas, C4H6, to yield C8H12 gas is a second order reaction. Second order, that's important. I'm gonna circle that. With a rate constant, that's our K, under certain conditions. If the initial concentration of butadiene 
is 0 0.200 molar. What is the concentration after 10 minutes? So I'm just going to list out some of these things we have. So we know, first of all, that it's second order. So that tells me I'm going to be using the second order integrated rate law, which is as follows. I'm just going to write it out and refer to my chart, um, my handy dandy cheat sheet that tells me all of the different integrated rate laws. I'm just going to copy it down. It also tells me that the K value for this order, the rate constant, is 5.76 times 10 to the negative 2 inverse molarity, inverse second. It also tells me the initial concentration. The initial concentration is the concentration at time zero, and it is 0 0.200 molar, and it wants to know what is the concentration um, after 10 minutes. So time is 10 minutes, okay? Um, one thing I'm going to point out already is that my constant is the time unit in the constant is seconds, but the time it gives me in the problem is in minutes. And I want those to match before I even plug them into this formula. So I am going to convert minutes into seconds. And there are 60, oops, there are 60 seconds in one minute. So 10 minutes is 600 seconds. Okay, so now I have all these variables just to check them off, okay? I am looking for this one. Oops, I wanted to do this in a different color. Let's do green. All right, so this is the one I'm looking for, the, con the final concentration, the concentration at 10 minutes time t, right? I know my time, I know my rate constant, and I know my initial concentration, so I'm ready to go. Um, so I have one over concentration at time t equals k. My k is 5.76 times 10 to the negative 2 inverse meter inverse seconds times t time in seconds, 600 seconds, plus 1 over um, 0 0.200 molar. All right, so I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. Concentration at time t equals, so 5.76 times 10 to the negative 2 times 600 is... 34.56 and our seconds cancel out so we end up with inverse molar and 1 over 0.2 is 5 and this is also going to be inverse molarity because that molarity unit is on the bottom okay so these are like terms I can add them together so together they equal 39 0.56 inverse molarity. So what I have here, this is where students sometimes forget their math. Um, so I don't have AT equals 39. I have one over AT. So this, so the inverse of the concentration I'm looking for equals, oops, equals 39.56. Brr. 39.56 inverse molar. So I need to inverse both of these. In other words, I need to do one over each of these. I need to flip them. So in other words, you could think of this one as 39.56 over one. So basically I need to flip both of these over. So then I get A concentration of AT equals one over 39.56, which equals 0 0.0253. And that's molar concentration. So in other words, what we found was that when we start with a concentration of 0.2 molar and we go for 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, 
the amount that's left of this reactant is only 0 0.0253 molar is how much is left. Okay, so that's just a couple of different ways where we would use these integrated rate laws in problems. The integrated rate law can also be mathematically manipulated to give us another equation, and that is the equation for half-life. So half-life is the time required for the concentration of a reactant to fall to, you guessed it, one half of the initial value. So in other words, at time zero, initially, um, you have some amount of reactant, you have 100% of your reactant, okay? And after one half-life, you're gonna have 50%, half of that reactant is gonna be left. After another half-life, you'll have half of that left. So 25 is half of 50. And then you keep going and going and going. So each for after each half-life, you are having the concentration. It's being reduced by 50%. And different reactions have the, the time here um, of the half-life could be seconds, it could be minutes, it could be hours, it could be days. So different reactions have different half-lives. A short half-life is a fast um, reaction and a long half-life would be a slow reaction. So we'll say short half-life and we use T sub one half to represent half-life um, equals a fast reaction and a long half-life is a slow reaction. The classic um, study of half-lives comes with radioactive elements. So radioactive decay the, is a reaction where unstable atoms decay into other atoms and give off radiation. And all radioactive elements, all radioactive isotopes have a half-life and some decay very quickly over several minutes or hours or days, and some take years, have half-lives that are thousands of years long, and they decay very, very slowly. So if a reaction is zero order, the half-life equation that can be magically derived from the integrated rate law is the magic of calculus, um, is this. This is the equation for half-life for a zero-order reaction. For a first-order reaction, the equation for half-life is 0.693, which is the natural log of 2, if you were wondering where that came from, over k. And for a second-order reaction, the half-life formula is 1 over k times the initial concentration. Okay. So notice that second order and zero order reactions, all right, both have um, the initial concentration as part of that formula. And notice that the first order reaction does not. So first order reactions um, are the only ones where the half-life is independent of the concentration. In other words, it doesn't matter how much of the reactant you have, doesn't matter what the starting concentration is, the half-life is always the same for first order reactions. That's not true for zero order or second order reactions. It's something to understand about these equations here because that could be phrased in a question. Which, you know, which of the following reactions um, would have a half-life that's independent of concentration? and then it gives you choices of zero order, first order, second order. Um, all right, so let's do a practice problem. Example, molecular iodine dissociates at 625 Kelvin with a rate constant of 0 0.271 inverse seconds. What is the half-life for the dissociation of five grams of iodine at this temperature? All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out, well, what is the order of the reaction? All 
all right? So in order to determine what the half-life is, we need to know which of these to use. And this problem doesn't tell us what is the order. How could you tell the reaction order? I hinted to it earlier. Hopefully you said you would look at the units of K, all right? The units of K are inverse seconds. So look at units of K, all right? And inverse seconds tells us that this is a first order reaction. So now that we know the order, we know which half-life equation to use. For our first order reaction, the half-life is just going to be 0.693 divided by k. So it doesn't even matter how much iodine we have. It doesn't matter um, because the half-life is always going to be the same. So we know k. It gives us k in the problem. So the half-life is just going to be 0.693 divided by 0.721 inverse seconds which is gonna equal 2.56 seconds. So this is a very short half-life of a couple of seconds. It decays very, or it uh, dissociates very quickly at this high temperature of 625. Um, here's another example problem. It says, calculate the rate constant for the second order reaction using the data below. And it gives us this visual. So um, at zero seconds, at time zero, um, we have a one molar solution. And, um, or one mole, you know, one molar concentration of our reactant. And as time progresses, um, we have less and less of that reactant as is, you know, depicted in this colors, the color scheme, the color fading. Okay, so it goes from zero seconds uh, or it goes from one molar to 0.5 molar. So in other words, that's half. So this is one half-life that we are watching pass. And from 0.5 molar to 0.25 molar, that's another half-life. All right, so what is the length of this half-life? Well, it tells us the length of the half-life is going from zero hours to six hours, or in other words, zero seconds to 2.16 times 10 to the fourth seconds. Um, so that is our half-life, either in hours or in seconds. And I'm going to use it in seconds in this problem. So the other thing we need, so in order to figure out which half-life reaction or half-life equation we're using, we need to know what order the reaction is. And it tells us that this is a second order reaction. So the second order reaction, we're using this equation of half-life one over K times the initial concentration. So we can do this. Um, the half-life, oh, it wants us to know what is the rate constant. So we're looking for K. We are needing to solve K. We know the initial concentration, boop. And we know the half-life. It is 6 hours or 2.16 times 10 to the 4th seconds. So now we're just, we just need to solve for K. So I'm just going to plug in. Um, so the half-life is 2.16 times 10 to the 4th seconds equals 1 over K times 1.00 molar. All right, I'm going to multiply. I'm going to sort of flip these two. Um, take the inverse of both sides, I guess, is another way of saying it. So... Um, one, what did I do here? My notes are messed up. So I'm going to get K times one molar equals one over 2.16 times 10 to the fourth seconds. Um, so K Actually, I want K by itself, so I'm going to divide both sides by one molar. Uh, 
and now I'm going to solve. So k equals 1 divided by I think I did this right in my notes. I got 4.63 times 10 to the negative fifth. 1 divided by 2.16 times 10 to the negative, times 10 to the fourth equals this. And my units are inverse molarity and inverse seconds because both of those are in the denominator there. All right, so that is my K. And these are the correct units for a second order reaction. So even if I did lose sight of my units here in the equation, I should be able to um, either use the table or dredge my memory for the correct units for a second order uh, rate constant. Okay, so that's just another flavor of question that you could get asked about half-life. And here's a third. Let's see, a first order reaction so first order has a half-life of 26.4 seconds. So if this is a first order reaction and it gives me a half-life, I'm going to go ahead and write out the half-life equation for a first order reaction, 0.693 over K, because I'm probably going to need that. Um, how long does it take for the concentration of the reactant to fall to one-sixth of its initial value? If it's asking me how long something takes. That is telling me I also am going to need to use the integrated rate law. So in this problem, I'm using both the half-life equation and the integrated rate law equation. And if I didn't know that, I could just write them both, because honestly, in this, you know, this part of the chapter, the only two equations we're dealing with are integrated rate laws, and there's three of them, first order, second order, zero order, and half-life equations. So those are the only equations I have in my arsenal, really, to write out, and I can sort of figure out what to do with them next. So let's see, what do I have? Um, I have the half-life, all right, point zero, zero point six nine three is, I don't I don't need that. I mean, that's a number. It's not a variable. Um, I don't know K. So that's a problem. I can't use this equation. Oh, or no. So I can use this equation because I know the half-life and I know 0.693. So I can find K using this half-life equation. So I think I'm going to do that first, find K. And then if I have K, if I can check that off. Um, I don't know time. This is ultimately what I want to find. How long does it take? I want to know the time. Um, I don't know the initial and final concentration, but I know a proportion. So remember before we, we said what, you know, what happens if it de decreases by 80%. Okay, so in other words, one-sixth of one. So we could plug in one let's say one molar for this and one sixth molar for this as our final concentration. And then we could solve for time. So that's what I'm gonna do. So we're gonna do our work in green. The first thing we're gonna do is use the half-life equation to solve for K. I'm just gonna rearrange it so I can solve for K. So if half-life equals 0.693 over K and K equals 0.693 over half-life and 0.693 over the half-life that we are given in the problem of 26.4 seconds. That means our K is 0 0.02625 inverse seconds. And I carried it out an extra significant figure because I'm not done um, ultimately with the problem. So that's the first thing I did. I used this equation to solve for k, and now I can plug it in here. So the second thing I'm gonna do is use the integrated rate law, where I'm gonna say that my um, uh, final, final concentration is one-sixth of the original, so one-sixth of one molar, and I'm just gonna convert that to a decimal. So one over six is 0 0.16666 
repeating. Um, and minus k, minus 2, 6. Oops, that's not k, that's my half-life. So minus 0 0.02625 inverse seconds times t, that's my variable I'm trying to solve for, times the natural log of 1. Right, and the nice thing about that is the natural log of 1 is 0, so we can remove that from the equation. The natural log of 0.16666667, so I just typed into my calculator 1 divided by 6, got that long repeating number, and then I clicked natural log, ln. I get negative 1.79 2 equals negative 0 0.02625 t. Divide both sides by negative 0 0.02625 and we get t equals 68.3 seconds. Time is another thing that can't be negative, right? can't go backwards in time. I mean, maybe you can like on a quantum level, but definitely not in, in kinetics experiments. So if you get a negative number, you know you lost a negative sign somewhere and you probably want to find it. Um, so time, in other words, it's saying that in order for us to um, decline in concentration uh, from whatever our starting is to one-sixth of that, it's going to take 68.3 seconds. And honestly, we could only do a problem like this if it is a first-order reaction because it's the only one where we don't need to know the initial concentration because the half-life doesn't depend. The half-life is independent of the initial concentration. So it's the only one we could actually solve for K without an actual starting concentration. So this here, this table, hmm, let's highlight it in yellow. Okay, this is your cheat sheet. You want to have this table nice and handy when you are doing problems in this chapter. It has everything on here. So it has the rate law. It doesn't have rate expression, that's the only thing. So it has the rate law for zero order, first order, and second order reactions. It has our units of K for the rate constant for the different reactions. It gives us the integrated rate law equations for each order. And it even tells us what we would need to plot for a linear fit of the rate data, which we don't even really need if we have the integrated rate law. This is y and this is x. This is y and this is x. This is y and this is x. So it's always x will always be t. But what we graph as our y-axis will be different. Um, also, it tells us the slope of the line for each of those with the linear plot of the integrated rate law. And it tells us the equation for the half-life. So this is a very good table to reference when you're doing homework problems. So now to step away from the math side of things. Um, and talk about the uh, sort of molecular side of things. When we are talking about kinetics, we're talking about the speed of chemical reactions, but what is happening really in a chemical reaction? So the theory of chemical reactions is called collision theory or kinetic molecular theory. And this theory is that... Um, that molecules react when they collide. And not just any collisions result in reactions, but only con collisions that, that meet two specific conditions. So the first condition is that they need to collide hard enough. So in this first scenario here, um, these two molecules, they collide, but not very hard. The little small yellow star means they didn't collide very hard and they ended up just bouncing off of each other and nothing happened. All right, they also need to collide in the correct orientation. So these two collided, but in the wrong direction. So the O's, the oxygens bumped each other and that's not the correct orientation. And so 
no reaction happened. So the only reaction, the only time we get a reaction is when these two molecules bump hard enough and in the correct orientation where C and O bump into each other. And that results in the chemical reaction. So CO and O2 become CO2 and O. And so these are the two things that must happen. They need to collide hard enough or with enough energy, and they need to co collide in the correct orientation in order for a reaction to occur. So there are lots of things that affect reaction rate that affect basically through this collision theory. So the first is concentration. And of course, we are seeing that in a lot of the um, rate laws, right? So concentration, um, that's the whole point of rate laws. It talks about, it shows us the relationship between the concentration of reactants and the effect on rate. And so if we increase concentration as a rule, we're going to increase the rate according to the rate law. So for zero order reactions, that would be the exception. For zero order reactions, if we increase concentration, nothing happens to the rate. But for first order, second order, whatever other order, if we increase the concentration, we increase the rate. Just by what factor depends on the rate law, the order of the reaction. But in general, a concentration increase is a rate increase. Another thing that increases the rate of the reaction is temperature. And temperature, when we increase the temperature, we of course are also going to increase the rate. And that's something we know very intuitively. You know, we see that with a lot of, I don't know, when you cook stuff. Um, so the reason that increasing the temperature increases the reaction rate is because the particles are moving faster. There's more kinetic energy when we increase the temperature. And the faster the particles are moving around, then the harder they're gonna collide. And the harder they collide, the more of them are going to meet the, the requirements for a reaction to occur. Same thing with concentration. The more particles we have flying around in a space, the more collisions are going to happen. So basically all of these factors that affect reaction rate are things that increase collision frequency. All right, increasing concentration will increase collision frequency. Increasing temperature increases collision fr frequency. Another thing is um, the reaction volume. And this is only relevant for gases because gases are compressible. So if we decrease the volume um, of a gas, then we're decreasing the amount of space those molecules can fly around in. And we're actually, basically, we're in, when we decrease the volume of a gas, we're increasing its concentration. So this is an inverse relationship. When we decrease the volume, we increase the rate. All right. Think of it as there's less space for the molecules to move around in. Hence, more frequency of collisions. Um, another way to increase the rate of the reaction is to increase the surface area um, of the reactants, all right? Increase the surface area, you increase the rate, all right? Think of like a sugar cube versus powdered sugar or granulated sugar. Okay, um, one's gonna dissolve faster than the other and that's because it has a greater surface area. Um, if you were doing some kind of chemical reaction, not a physical reaction of dissolving um, using sugar, all right, again, the powdered sugar is going to react faster than the sugar cube because there's a greater surface area of all these tiny particles all having exposed surfaces versus the cube that just only has the cube surfaces exposed. So again, that's just going to increase the, the number of um, surfaces where collisions can occur. And then lastly, we can increase the um, reaction rate by adding a catalyst. And a catalyst is something that speeds up chemical reactions. 
speeds up chemical reactions. And the last part of the chapter is going to be talking more about these catalysts and how they do that. So just to look at a reaction diagram. This is an energy diagram of a reaction, and we've seen these before. Um, uh, and we're going to look at the part that determines the speed, the rate of the reaction. So if we had some generic reaction A plus B, these are the reactants, um, A and B. Okay, so this is the energy of the reactants right here. This spot here is the energy of the reactants, All right? And C and D are our products. Down here, this is the energy of the products because energy is what's on the y-axis here, all right? And then you see there's this uphill and then this downhill. Now, overall, the reaction is downhill because the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. That tells us that this is an exothermic reaction. In other words, that delta H, the enthalpy, the change in heat, is negative. All right, it's overall, it's going down. Um, it's releasing energy. But there's another energy measurement here, this Ea. All right, Ea is the activation energy. That's a little bit sloppy, but... Um, so activation energy. And activation energy, you can think of it as it's, well, it's, the definition is it's an energy barrier that must be overcome for the reaction to go. In other words, it's like, it's like a push you have to give the reaction. So I like to think of a ball at the top of a hill. So a ball at the top of a hill has a lot of potential energy right? But it's not going to roll down the hill unless you give it a little nudge. And once you give a little nudge, then it spontaneously goes down the hill, but it needs that nudge first. Um, so same thing with reactions. A lot of reactions, if you uh, have a piece of wood and you light it on fire, the fire keeps going. Combustion of wood is a spontaneous process, but it needs energy in order to get started. You have to add fire you have to add heat in order for it to combust and then once it is it is burning it will continue to burn until all of the reactant the wood is used up okay and so that that sort of uh, initial amount of energy that you have to put in to a reaction in order to get it to go spontaneously is called the activation energy and the the activation energy can be calculated um so it equals, the activation energy is the energy, it's the transition energy, transition energy, and the transition state is the top of the peak here, the top of the hill, um, minus the energy of reactants. Energy, in energy, I spelled, oh, spelled that wrong of reactants. Okay, so in other words, it's from the energy of the reactants, if we draw a line from the energy of the reactants, to the top of the hill here, that's the activation energy. Whereas the enthalpy, right, the heat of the reaction, that is the difference between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products. So it is right here. Right, being able to understand and label these different parts of the reaction energy diagram is important. So the larger the activation energy is, and again, let's think of this activation energy as this, you know, this uphill climb that we have to do. The more uphill climb you have, the harder it is and the slower you will go. I like to think of myself as like a little person on a bicycle in the reactant section. And so the shorter this hill is, the faster I'm gonna be able to bike. So the larger it is, the slower I'm gonna be able to bike. So the larger the activation energy, the slower the reaction. And likewise, the smaller the activation energy, the faster the reaction. All right, let's do a quick practice problem where we just graph out, practice graphing out 
an energy diagram. So it says uh, a chemical reaction is endothermic and it has an activation energy that is twice the value of the enthalpy change. So it is endothermic. That means it has a positive delta H, which means it's going to overall be an uphill reaction, okay? And it has an activation energy that is twice, oops, equals twice the enthalpy change. All right, so let's just um, draw some axes here. So this, the, the x-axis is time or progress of the reaction and the y-axis is energy. I'm just gonna put an E for energy. And I'm gonna pick some random value. I'm gonna just put this as my energy of reactants. So this is my reactants. And um, my activation energy needs to be twice the enthalpy. So let's say, let's make the enthalpy, I don't know how many of these blocks, let's say, let's just do it right here and then we'll count. So if this is the products, the energy of the products, then my enthalpy, all right, my uphill change is three blocks. <laughs> three of these blocks, all right? So then my transition state needs to be, my, my um, activation energy needs to be twice that. So I'm gonna go up another three blocks. So here is where my transition state's gonna be. So, ta-da! And this was totally arbitrary. I could have picked, you know, a greater um, enthalpy, a greater activation energy. So here's my activation energy, which is twice as much as my enthalpy, as directed. All right, so that's just an example. We just drew out a chemical reaction. It's endothermic, it increased energy, so it was an overall uphill reaction, and it has an activation energy that's twice the value of the enthalpy change. And we could label these um, energies. We could say, um, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Why not? Okay, so um, our enthalpy change here is 20 to 35. So our enthalpy, the way that I labeled this was 15. Um, let's call these kilojoules. And the activation energy was from 20 to 50. So it was a total of 30 kilojoules. Ta-da! Alrighty. So the rate constant, K. Um, we know that reaction rate is temperature dependent. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate. So what temperature does, it speeds up chemical reactions by actually increasing the value of the rate constant. So I pointed out earlier how temperature was kind of a red herring in one of our example problems, but really it's relevant because of course the rate constant will be different depending on the temperature. Um, the activation energy also uh, plays a role as part of what goes into the calculation of K, the rate constant. So the rate constant K is a value that's dependent on the temperature and the activation energy of a reaction. And there's actually a formula for us to calculate the value of K just based on those things. So K, our reaction, or sorry, our rate constant, um, is equal to A times E to the power of EA over RT, okay? so. What are all these things? Well, K is the rate constant. Same K we've been dealing with. Rate constant. A is something called the frequency factor. And I don't even totally understand what it is because it's too physics-y <laughs> for me. 
E is a number, just like pi is a number. Pi is 3.14, blah, 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 blah. All right, E is also a number. It's a value, and it happens to be 2.71828. Um, EA is our activation energy. Um, R. R is our gas constant, but it's a different value than the one we're used to um, because this one is in different units. So it's 8.314 joules per mole K as opposed to the one that we're used to with liter atmospheres per, per mole K. Um, and then T is, of course, temperature. And since R oops, is in... Uh, have the temperature unit is Kelvin, then it's important that our temperature unit here be in Kelvin. Kelvin is necessary because Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale, so there's no negative values in Kelvin. And a negative value like negative Fahrenheit or negative te Celsius temperature would mess up the math here. So in other words, with this equation, if we were to plug in numbers here, we would find that at higher temperatures, the higher the K value is going to be. So the higher the temperature, the greater the rate constant is going to be, and the faster the reaction will be. Also, the higher the activation energy, the smaller the K is going to be, because activation energy is in the numerator of that exponent. Okay, so if we were to plug in values here, we could show mathematically that the as um, activation energy gets higher, the K, the rate constant, gets smaller. And we know that uh, the higher activation energies are slower reactions. So let's do a just a quick problem using the Arrhenius equation. So I'm not going to give you any um, complicated math here. So uh, this Arrhenius equation, um, let me just go back to it up here. All right, so I'm um, trying to solve for one of these exponential values, so the temperature or the activation energy, that's just, it's just a pain in the ass. So um, I'm going to stick with just for ease, stick with problems where you solve for K, but technically you could have a problem where it asks you to solve for the activation energy or for the temperature um, and give you these other values. Um, but it's just a pain in the ass mathematically to have to do inverse logs to, to find exponents. So we're just going to stick with ones that ask you, what is the rate constant? And so the Arrhenius equation says that the rate constant is A times E to the power of negative EA over RT. In this problem, it gives us K. No, sorry, it's asking us for K. It gives us A. Um, A is the frequency factor. The frequency factor is 1.2 times 10 to the 13 inverse seconds. Cool. E is a number. It's in my calculator as E, so I'm just going to place E there, even though it's not a variable. To the negative um, e, uh, activation energy. 8.37 times 10 to the fifth joules divided by R, 8.314 joules per mole K times T, temperature. And the temperature is 32 degrees Celsius, which if I add 273, I get 305 Kelvin. So I'm gonna plug that in there. Right? It's kind of a, a mouthful of math. So the first thing I wanted, I'm going to do is solve that exponent. So I'm just going to copy out this part. K equals 1.2 times 10 to the 13 inverse seconds times E to the all this jazz. All right, so if I do all that, if I do, oops, I meant to change this is incorrect. This should be 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fourth. Okay, so if I uh, substitute that in, then I get this whole x 8.37 times 10 to the fourth divided by 0.8314 div 
divided by 305 is equal to 33.00. All right, so e to the negative 33.00. I'm going to type that into my calculator. I'm just still going to copy this um, part down. So e to the negative 33 is, I just type in my calculator, negative 33. Not minus 33, but the negative sign, 33. And then I type e, and then I click e. Um, no, I click e to the x. There's a function in my calculator that says e to the x power. So I type in negative 33 e to the x power, and that gives me the value of 4.659 times 10 to the negative 15. And now I can finally solve for k. It is 0. 0.0. .0 five, six inverse seconds. All right, so here's a pop question for you. What order is this reaction? And you should be able to answer this based on, look at the units of K. And they are just inverse seconds, and that is the uh, units for a first order reaction, right? So there's nothing about this equation that tells us per se. Um, technically, actually, the frequency factor. So the frequency factor will have the same units as k. So we could have could have figured it out from that, but definitely from uh, doing the problem here. Okay. So just like with the integrated rate law, we did some magical calculus to give us some linear equations. From We took the rate law, we did some calculus, and got these integrated rate laws, the linear equations. We can also take the Arrhenius equation, do some magical calculus, and end up with some linear equations. And those are as follows. We have this one, the ln of k equals negative activation energy over R times 1 over T plus the natural log of A, which is our frequency factor. In this case, A is that frequency factor, not like concentration of reactant A. Um, so this is a linear equation. And um, we can use it to determine activation energy from data. All right, so whenever we see a linear equation, just to remind you, a linear equation is one in the format of m, nope, why do I keep doing that? Of y equals m x plus b where y and x are coordinates, m is the slope, and b is the y-intercept. Um, another equation, linear equation that we have, is this one here, ln of k2 over k1 equals positive ea over r times one over t1 minus one over T2, okay? And this one is, you can see we have K1 and K2, T1 and T2. So this is when we're given two different rate constants at two different temperatures. We can use that to determine the activation energy. So we can use this to find activation energy when given two rate constants at two different temps. All right, so again, these are useful for determining activation energy of a reaction by doing the reaction at different temperatures, measuring the, uh, 
the rate and the rate constant, and then you can figure out what the activation energy is. So just in an example problem here, uh, the decomposition of ozone reaction is O3, that's ozone, reacts or decomposes into oxygen gas, and so O2 gas and O gas. The study of the kinetics of this reaction resulted in the following data on this chart here. Use the graph to determine the activation energy. So we have a line here that's graphed it. We've graphed the data, and then the program has also given us the equation for the line, the y equals mx plus b equation. All right, so we have y equals negative 1.12x, oops, sorry, times 10 to the fourth x plus 26.8. All right, that lines up with our linear Arrhenius equation, ln of k equals negative Ea over R times 1 over T plus natural log of the frequency factor, A. Right? We don't know what K is, and we don't know what A is, but we don't need to for this reaction. To, in order to solve the activation energy, all right, the activation energy is this is part of the slope here. And the slope is given to us in this problem. So in other words, we can sort of ignore the rest of these equations because we have the component that we need. In other words, um, negative 1.12 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to negative Ea over R. And we know R, R is a constant. So I'm going to just, nah, I will say negative Ea over 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And now we can solve for negative Ea by multiplying both sides by 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 8.314 do do so our activation energy equals drum roll da, 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 9.31 times 10 to the fourth joules per mole all right and i I'm just realizing I lost a negative sign. This is, um, I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1 as well in order to convert those both to positives because my activation energy should be a positive. And it is because I used my notes to remind myself that. So this is our activation energy and we figured it out just from the slope of that line and we knew the slope of the line because we knew the linear equation for that line. And this element here is the, is the slope. Um, another practice problem, a different type of question. For the following reaction, the rate constant at 701K, so I'm given a temperature, is 2.57 meters per, or molarity per second, inverse molarity per second, well, Blah. Inverse molarity, inverse seconds. And at 895 Kelvin, oops, I'm given a second temperature, it's 567 inverse molarity, inverse seconds. So I'm given two temperatures and two rate constants. So I already know I'm going to use that second equation from the previous page. So my initial temperature, 701 Kelvin, and the rate at that temperature, the rate constant is 2.57. And my second temperature, 895 Kelvin, Kelvin, um, and the rate constant is 567 inverse meters for inverse seconds. P.S., 
do not confuse your rate constant k with the capital K that is Kelvin, okay? To further confuse things, we have a third K that we're gonna meet in the next chapter when we talk about equilibrium. But for now, they at least look different. So lowercase k is the rate constant, uppercase k here is our temperature unit of Kelvin. They are not the same. Um, all right, so the equation we're gonna use was this one natural log of k2 over k1 equals the activation energy over r times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. And we want to know what is the activation energy, so that's what we are solving for. Um, r is a constant, we know that. We're given both of the k's and both of the t's, so we're ready to rock and roll here with some plug and chug, as they say. So the natural log of K2, 567 over K1, 2.57, equals EA over 8.314 joules per mole degree, or mole Kelvin, times 1 over 701 Kelvin minus 1 over 895 Kelvin. Now we just need to simplify all this. So um, 567 divided by 2.57 is 220.62. So we'll take the natural log of 220.62. And I'm going to simplify that what's in the parentheses. So 1 over 701 minus 1 over 895. I turned these into decimals and then put those in my calculator and I got 0 0.0003092 Kelvin or inverse Kelvin. So now I'm going to divide Nope, I'm going to take my natural log first. So the natural log of 220 is 5.396. And 0 0.003092 divided by 8.34. So I'm just going to move this over here. Get EA by itself. Um, so we got E. A, the activation energy, times 3.719 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, and if I divide both sides by 3.719 times 10 to the negative fifth, that cancels out, and I get an activation energy of... 1.45 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. All right, so that is the activation energy that you would solve if you did some experiments at two different temperatures and got those two different rate constants. All right, if you haven't paused to take a break yet, you're crazy. The last part last part I promise of the chapter, is talking about reaction mechanisms. So we keep talking about these different reactions um, as if they all happen in one step. But the truth is most chemical reactions that we study actually happen in multiple steps. They occur over several small steps. Um, and the, so the series of individual steps that they occur by is something we call the reaction mechanism. The reaction mechanism. So for example, if we have this reaction here, H2 hydrogen plus two iodine chloride, iodide chloride um, reacts to form two hydrogen chloride and one uh, diatomic iodine molecule, okay? This reaction, you would think, is just 
you know, one, this is one reaction. But in fact, what's happening, this reaction is happening in two steps. So the first step is that the H2 and one of the ICL molecules bump into each other and form hydrogen iodide and hydrogen chloride. Then in the second step, hydrogen iodide plus another of the ICL molecules bump into each other to form another hydrogen chloride and some diatomic iodine. If we add these two reactions together, we get that overall reaction. So um, H2 plus HI plus two ICLs, one, two, um, add together to form HI, two HCLs, one from the top and one from the bottom, one from step one, one from step two, and one I2. All right, notice that we have HI on both sides of the reaction. So those cancel out. And when it cancels out like that, we've seen this before when we were talking about precipitation reactions and we had spectator ions. So this HI is kind of like those spectator ions, except not really. So it's um, something that's called a reaction intermediate. So HI is a reaction intermediate. So in other words, it forms in step one, but then it's all used up in step two. So it, it forms temporarily in the process of this two-step reaction, but it's not on the reactant or product side because it forms in the middle and disappears in the middle. So we never actually measure it, its presence. It's, an, it's a reaction intermediate. It temporarily forms and then gets consumed. All right, each of these steps in the reaction mechanism is called an elementary step. It's elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary step. And elementary just means like simple, right? So these each of these steps are the sort of simplest chemical collision that can happen. And so elementary steps, there's really only a few um, sort of molecularities of elementary steps. So when we think about collision theory, right? Collision theory says that two things will, you know, when, when things collide, there's the potential for a reaction to occur. And a reaction is just breaking of some bonds and reforming of other bonds. And so um, since they have to collide with the proper energy and the proper orientation, it's much more statistically likely that two things will be able to collide in the correct orientation at the proper energy. Okay, it's less likely that um, three things will be able to collide all at once in the correct orientation at the, you know, proper energy. And it's nearly impossible for four things or five things or more than that to collide. So really, when it comes to elementary steps, we, we think of sort of the maximum amount of particles that can really collide. Um, and a chemical reaction to occur in an elementary step is three. And so we can have unimolecular, bimolecular, or termolecular. I don't know why it's not trimolecular, but, um, and these are involving either one substance, so that's still two, two things colliding, but it's just two of the same thing. Um, bimolecular is two, different things are colliding and trimolecular or termolecular, sorry, is three things colliding. All right, so in a unimolecular reaction, we have one reactant. So one mole of A reacts to form products, all right? And the rate law looks something like this. For a bimolecular reaction, we have two things. So it could either be A plus A, or in other, another way to write that is 2A, reacts to form products. 
okay? Or A plus B reacts to form products. Either way, we have two moles of reactant. Um, and termolecular has three moles of reactant. So either you have 3A reacts to form product or 2A plus B or um, A plus B plus C react to form product. So three different things colliding together. So um, I'm going to sort of unteach you something from earlier in the chapter. So remember when we talked about rate law not integrate rate law, but rewind all the way back to rate law, all right, where we have rate equals k times, let's say, a to the x and b to the y, all right? Remember we said x and y, those orders, they have to come from experimental data. They do not, they're not related to the coefficients in the equation, okay? Well, that's true for overall reactions. But for elementary steps, x and y actually do come from the coefficients. So specifically for elementary steps, the reactant coefficients are the reactant order. And we can see that here in this column here. So for example, in this bimolecular reaction here, we have A plus A reacts to form products. In other words, that's 2A reacts to form products. And we see that the rate law is K times the concentration of A squared. That 2 came from this coefficient. And then also if we look at this reaction here, it's a termolecular reaction where we have 3A reacts to form products. Well, this is a third order reaction, that 3 uh, is directly related to that coefficient there. So the sort of exception, we I taught you in the first half of the chapter, do not use the coefficients for the x and y in the rate law. But now I'm telling you, you can, uh, but only if it's an elementary step, only if we know it's an elementary step, not for an overall reaction. So let's look at uh, an example. Um, oop, just one more thing to talk to talk about in this uh, reaction mechanism is that in these um, multiple steps, right, they're not all the same speed. They're not all going the same speed. So whichever one is the slowest is the one that we call the rate determining determining step or sometimes the rate limiting step, RDS or RLS for rate limiting step, okay? And it's, I like to think of a, like a line of traffic of cars, like maybe you're stuck behind a snow plow, right? You have a bunch of cars go driving to Plattsburgh and um, they're all stuck behind the snow plow. So how fast are all of the cars going? Well, they're going the same speed as the snow plow because whichever, if the car in front is going slow, then all of the cars behind it are going that same speed. They can't go faster than the front car. And so, um, and that's true with chemical reactions as well. So if you have a, a um, reaction mechanism that has multiple elementary steps, whichever step is slowest is gonna be the one that determines the speed for the overall reaction just like that snow plow determines the speed for all of the traffic. Even if the other cars wanna go faster and could go faster, they can't because they can only go as fast as that snow plow in front of them, all right? Now this is a, a little bit oversimplified um, because sometimes we have reversible reactions um, that happen first, quick reversible reactions, and calculating the rate for those situations is a little bit more complicated. So we're just gonna stick to the simple ones where we have a slow step followed by a fast step. So the example problem that I'm gonna work or show you the example reaction here, uh, nitrogen dioxide plus carbon monoxide reacts to form nitrogen monoxide plus carbon dioxide. And the rate law for this reaction is rate equals K um, times the concentration of NO2 squared. This is the rate law that was determined by experimental data. 
okay? So experimentation was done and we determined that this was the rate law for this reaction. Um, so that means that this reaction is actually made up of, of steps. It's, it's an overall reaction because this rate law does not match the stoichiometry of this reaction here. So the two steps that make up this reaction are pictured here. Right, NO2 plus NO2 reacts to form NO and NO3, and NO3 plus CO reacts to form NO2 and CO2. So the first question we have is, which step is the rate determining step? So it's going to be whichever step that matches, the, that the stoichiometry of the step matches the rate law, that the coefficients match the rate law, because the rate law is going to be the rate of the slowest step. So which step has NO2 with a 2 in front? All right, so NO2 plus NO2 is the same thing as 2NO2. So this is the step that matches this rate law. All right, so step 1 is our rate limiting step or our rate determining step because it matches the coefficient. So 2 NO2 NO plus NO3, all right? It, the reactants here match that. Um, the second question about this problem is which is the intermediate? What molecule here is the intermediate? In other words, what molecule shows up in the steps but doesn't show up in the um, overall reaction? And that's going to be our NO3. All right, our NO3 is our intermediate because it shows up in the first step, it gets used up in the second step, and it's not present at all in the overall reaction. So how about you try this one yourself? I want you to predict the overall reaction and the rate law that results from the following two-step mechanism. So step one, and this is just very generic, 2A reacts to form A sub 2, and this reaction is slow, and step two, this reaction is fast. So first let's predict the overall reaction, and we simply do that by adding these two reactions together. So 2A Right. Well, first I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel out my intermediate a two a two those cancel out, so I'm gonna get two a plus b reacts to form a two b. So that's my overall reaction. The rate law for this reaction um, is going to be k times, and it's going to match the rate of the slowest reaction, and this is the slowest step, step one, and it is second going to be second order with respect to A because of that A is the only reactant and it has a coefficient of two. And for elementary steps, the rate law, the coefficient is the order, okay? So back to catalysis, I talked about it before as um, catalysts are one of the things that can speed up chemical reactions, right? That can speed up the rate so what is a catalyst? It's anything that speeds up a chemical reaction, but it's not actually used up in the reaction. So it goes in and comes out looking the same. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of an intermediate, as we'll see. Some terms to know, and I forgot to, uh, I usually capitalize things, not because they're important, but because they're things I want to blank out for you to fill in, whatever. So a homogeneous catalyst is one, homogeneous means the same, so it's a catalyst that's in the same physical state as the reactant. So let's say you're doing a reaction in aqueous solution in a liquid. If you add a liquid um, or aqueous catalyst, then it's in the same state. So acids, HCl, um, hydrochloric acid is a common, common um, catalyst. A heterogeneous catalyst, heterogeneous means different, so those are going to be in different physical states. So a lot of gaseous reactions are catalyzed by metals, catalytic metals. So those are solid um, catalysts with gaseous reactants. So those are different types of states. 
And then another important type of catalyst in biology are enzymes. So enzymes are made of protein. Proteins are an important type of biomolecule. And um, they bind to the reactant. So an, uh, the, anything that binds to an enzyme is called a substrate. So think of the substrate as the reactants, really. And they bind to the enzyme at an active site. So when they bind, the reaction is catalyzed. That's where the catalysis occurs. And then the products are formed and they leave the enzyme. And the enzyme can bind more substrate and keep going. But the enzyme itself is not changed in the reaction. Um, so it can be reused. I guess you can think of catalysts as very sustainable um, uh, substances because they don't get used up. You can keep reusing them over and over again. Um, so let's look at an example of a, of a catalytic reaction. So this example is um, that, that destruction of ozone. We actually saw this reaction this overall reaction earlier in the lecture <clears throat> in um, one of the, I don't know, uh, graphing some data reactions. But this reaction is actually uh, catalyzed by chlorine. And um, this is actually why aerosols are bad for the ozone layer and bad for the environment because they uh, include chlorine elements that release chlorine into the atmosphere that floats up into the atmosphere, ultimately to the ozone layer and depletes us, depletes the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is important because ozone actually absorbs some of the harmful, the more harmful wavelengths of UV light and pre prevents them from coming down to us. And so we need that UV there as a, basically like a, a sunscreen um, atmosphere and that's built into the atmosphere. So we've stopped using a lot of aerosols that contain these chlorine and ingredients. Anyway, um, step one of this reaction is <clears throat> um, chlorine plus ozone, O3, reacts to form chlorine monoxide and oxygen gas. And then chlorine monoxide plus oxygen reacts to form chlorine and O2. So there's two things in these steps that are not in the overall reaction, the chlorine and the chlorine monoxide. So there is a, a difference. So one of these things, so the chlorine monoxide here is, that is our intermediate. Um, ClO is the reaction intermediate because it forms and then it gets used up, okay? Whereas the chlorine, that one is our catalyst. The chlorine is the catalyst because it is a reactant initially and a product in the end here. So it goes in as chlorine and it comes out as chlorine which is different than the reaction intermediate, which is made and then used up. So hopefully that distinction is clear. Um, so you might have problems that ask you, what is the, gives you two steps and an overall reaction and says, what is the catalyst? What is the reaction intermediate? So be able to distinguish the two. So catalysts work by speeding, they speed up chemical reactions, but they speed it up by lowering the activation energy. Um, a lot of textbooks will say something like, it provides an easier path. All right, in other words, it sort of acts as a, there's a great TED Ed video um, that talks about different ways to speed up a chemical reaction or how to get a date to a, to a dance. And, um, and it talks about the catalyst as being sort of like a matchmaker. So the catalyst just br makes collisions more likely because it brings the reactants together in the proper orientation. And because of that, it lowers the activation energy. So if we look at this chart here, this is supposed to be my star, okay? 
Um, the red line represents an uncatalyzed reaction, and the green line represents a catalyzed reaction. So you can see that hump is smaller, the activation energy is lower, and so the reaction is going to be faster because a smaller activation energy, it's easier to get over that hump, and a faster reaction occurs. So the last question I have here is for you to try this one. Um, we have two reaction diagrams below. They represent the same reaction, one with a catalyst and one without. Estimate the reaction energy of each and identify which one involved a catalyst. So for A, we're going to find the activation energy. So the activation energy, of course, remember, is between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the transition state. So the difference in energy here is our activation energy. So for A, the activation energy, I would say that it is what? That's like 32 kilojoules minus like six kilojoules. So our activation energy here is 26 kilojoules versus in the second reaction, our activation energy is, what, 20 kilojoules minus still 6 kilojoules for a total of 14 kilojoules. So which one is the catalyzed reaction? It's going to be the one with the lower activation energy that is faster because it has a smaller hump. So this one is our catalyzed reaction. Alrighty, hopefully um, you'll come to class if you have questions and practice the homework. That's the end of chapter 17.